we need to establish norms and uh, red lines that should you cross this line, there will be reaction and the reaction will cause pain. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. On this week's show, Ben digs into the NSO group Pegasus spyware controversy. I look at a Catholic priest being outed through de-anonymized mobile device data. And later in the show, my conversation with Anup Ghosh, the CEO of Fidelis Cybersecurity, We're going to be discussing his views on the private sector hacking back. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. And now a word from our sponsor, Privacy.com. Protecting your identity and banking information online is critical and hard to achieve. Or is it? Keep your personal and business information safe and secure by using privacy's virtual cards instead of your real ones. Create single-use cards that can be closed whenever you want, or merchant-locked cards to ensure your cards can't be used anywhere else by anyone else. Learn more and get $5 for free at privacy.com slash caveat. All right, Ben. Uh, boy, we got a lot of... Uh, Big stories this week. Yes, don't we do. We? So let's let's jump right into it. Why don't you start things off for us? So I'm going to start with the big one. And ever since this was released, we actually have some caveat fans out there who have uh, contacted me via social media saying you got to talk about this. So <laughs> uh, we are fulfilling their wishes. So a big story came out this week from a bunch of news sources. Um, I'm using an article from the New York Times written by Ronan Bergman and Patrick Kingsley. Israeli spyware maker is in spotlight amid reports of widespread abuses. Mm. So data that was leaked to a bunch of different news organizations through a consortium suggests that a bunch of different countries, uh, including some very repressive governments around the world, are using Pegasus. That is a cyber espionage tool developed by NSO, uh, which is a Israeli cybersecurity, uh, cyber surveillance company. Mm. Uh, and so there are some major downstream effects uh, of this story. First and foremost, um, we now know that uh, this spyware has been used on journalists from countries as diverse as Azerbaijan, France, Hungary, India, and Morocco. So all different uh, levels of uh, de- countries of all at all different levels of development mm. um, have experienced the use of this cyber surveillance tool, and it's been used for. Very, I think, dangerous purposes, tracking journalists, trying to quash dissent in totalitarian countries. NSO and the Israeli government have pushed back uh, against this story. Uh, NSO itself categorically, <coughs> excuse me, denies the allegations. Mm. And, you know, they've been pretty forceful in denying it, saying that they don't know where this list came up with right. of all of the uh, contacts that or all of the devices on which the spyware has been uh, installed and the Israeli government has said that they ha- they don't really have enough time they haven't had enough time to react to the story to investigate it to hmm. figure out what the truth is. Yeah, it would, I mean NSO says that you know that uh, they sell this these tools for use to help fight against things like terrorism, but once it's out of their hands, they have no control over how these governments use the tool. Right, that's what they all say, um, <laughs> and I completely understand that perspective. I mean, I think there is a place for cyber espionage when we're talking about uh, terrorist surveillance. Right. But what this article notes is it's going to have second order effects on. Some very important things like um, what we consider in the United States to be First Amendment rights, Mm -hmm. free speech, freedom of association. The concern here is that because this technology is so good, because Pegasus, the system is so successful, it's going to have a chilling effect on First Amendment protected activities. So journalist communications with sources, activist communications with one another – Uh, we might get into an area where because people know that this technology is so powerful – uh, and that it can break even the most stringent uh, encryption systems, that it might be dangerous to engage in these communications. And that can be unduly repressive. And this isn't just happening in the Saudi Arabias of the world. It's mm. happening in Western democracies as well. Uh, so I think that's where you have the area of concern. The other angle that I think is interesting is the iPhone angle. 
So iPhone, you know, with this obviously with with the support of Apple, they the makers of iPhone have claimed that they have uh, the most stringent security features on the market. That's how they advertise themselves. Right, um, right. It's uh, they 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 lead with privacy as in a lot of their advertising campaigns. Absolutely. Um, basically, uh, you know, we are the industry leaders in privacy. You can feel safe that even the most nefarious actors aren't going to break into these devices. We now found out, uh, and as part of this Pegasus leak, um, and this comes from the Washington Post, that 23 separate Apple devices were successfully hacked uh, as part of Pegasus. Mm. And that exposes significant flaws in iPhone security. And where this has a political impact and you know where this has an impact on people's associational rights, free speech rights, is people are running out of places to communicate privately. And the ability to communicate pri- privately is very important to sustaining a democratic system of government, of holding uh, powerful authoritarian governments in check, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so if they are able to breach iPhones, which are constantly being updated with significant new security features, and you know, uh, and if they're able to uh, break into certain encrypted messaging applications, then we know that uh, the reach of this spyware program is is much larger than we previously knew. Hmm. Um, we also know now now we have lists of uh, at least alleged lists of people whose devices have been spied as part of the, this NSO spyware, um, and it's prominent individuals. They uh, we have articles now of prominent activists. We have this example in the Washington Post of an iPhone of a, the French wife of a political activist jailed in, in Morocco whose device was uh, breached by the spyware. Mm. And, you know, that's obviously going to have a deterrent effect on the ability to free her activist husband who's jailed in Morocco. Uh, so I think this does have dangerous downstream effects. I think that's why the story is is spreading so widely. It's why there's a big pushback. I think it's something that um, we're going to be talking about for a long time. You know, the U.S. has a, a list of uh, nations that you're not allowed to do business with, right? The things you're not allowed to export to certain places. Yes. North why, Korea. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Why does Israel allow this? Why, why, why open themselves up to this headache? So, I mean, there are a number of reasons, uh, and some of them are, are you know— Potentially, could we could be stepping on a couple of landmines here. I mean, Israel is known for being an industry leader among uh, countries, particularly Western democracies, in developing security technology. Right. And that's by necessity um, because they have to be so careful about their <laughs> right. own security. Right. The neighborhood in which they live. They are uh, surrounded by yes. hostile nations. Right. So, uh, so they have to do a good job. Yeah. Um, you know, they— are forced to develop this this type of advanced technology. And it ends up that, you know, in developing it, they've created a huge asset for their country, their economy, and their political economy. I mean, these the services that they develop are very valuable, not just to authoritarian governments, but to governments all over the world who want to track things like terrorism, drug trafficking, narcotics, uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I think you can understand why Israel uh, would want to to sell this product. I mean, it's a valuable export. Um, and, you know, until this story came out and other stories like it, you didn't have the sort of blowback that you get uh, for the fact that this, this spyware was used for uh, really disturbing uh, purposes. Mm-hmm. So you can see why they would want to sell it in the first place. I think— you know, now that both NSO and the Israeli government, uh, Israeli defense forces, are being subject to blowback from this article, maybe there might be some sort of change in their posture about um, how widely they want to sell these products, lest they be held responsible, at least in the court of public opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's that's you know a really interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I again, I, all nations do espionage. Um, but I guess that's that is well. Is that different from selling this tool? I I, I don't know. I, I I'm of two minds of this. Is you you could, I guess you can hear in my voice that on the one hand it is a legitimate tool. Like you could see it being used to help stop things like um, terrorism. For but, sure. But if you but at the same time, if you're selling it to certain regimes, how can you with a straight face say? 
uh, where you know, it's like uh, that scene from Casablanca. We're shocked, shocked to find that there's gambling like in this establishment. Yeah. You know, like, like, like uh, if you're selling it to certain regimes, how can you say with a straight face that you expect they're not going to use it for these sorts of things? Yeah. You know, one thing that's interesting is you have these two extremes. You have the clearly justified use, rooting out terrorism. Then you have the clearly nefarious use, which is cracking down on political dissent, spying on journalists, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The thing that's kind of interesting to me is you have these middle-of-the-road scenarios where they're using – countries are using Pegasus for – not, you know, things that are necessarily morally abhorrent, but are just kind of questionable. They talk about how uh, in this New York Times article, Pegasus was deployed in Mexico in 2017 against uh, policymakers and nutrition activists in the country who are pushing for a soda tax hmm. uh, in a country that has serious health problems. Sort of the original Mike Bloomberg proposal uh, in New York City, where if you tax soda, you can cut down on some public health problems related to obesity. Right. You know, is that as disturbing as cracking down on political dissidents and activists? No, but it's also, it doesn't seem to me to be a legitimate use of cyber espionage. Right, right. It's like calling up your buddy who's a police officer and asking him to run the plates on a car. Like, Yeah, uh, you're basically describing the Van Buren case, but yes. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Right, yeah. I mean, it's a misuse of a, because the, the tool is so casually available Right, there aren't guardrails on its use, so pe- so the folks who have access to it, uh, if no one's looking over their shoulder and, and and tracking, you know, what is it being used for? It's very easy for them to use it willy nilly, and then we have right. a problem. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, this this wouldn't be as much of a problem if Pegasus wasn't effective. It is effective. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why countries keep purchasing it and keep using it. Right. Uh, and they're going to keep purchasing it and keep using it unless there are tangible consequences. Now, you know, this is the, the first step in getting us to those tangible consequences now that we have this expose that was sent to a media consortium. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if this will inspire any countries in the short term to say we're not going to purchase um, – you know, this type of spyware from NSO. We're not going to purchase Pegasus anymore. Yeah. Um, to my mind, we haven't really seen that yet. Uh, I think countries are kind of hoping this will blow over because, you know, why use this, why lose this extremely effective tool if we don't have to? Right, right. Just let's keep it more quiet. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no. Yeah, boy, interesting. Uh, I guess a bit of a bombshell story when this was posted uh, recently. Yeah, yeah. It was something that... Uh, really uh, hit my inbox this weekend as a lot of people (laughs) were interested in it and kind of shocked by it. I mean, none other than uh, Edward Snowden himself said on Twitter that this is going to be the biggest story of the year. Hmm. Um, I don't know if I'd go that far, but it's it's a big story. The year is only half over, Ben. Exactly. There's plenty of time for more. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. I know. Be careful what you ask for. We should not jinx ourselves. Yeah, right. Don't tempt fate. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have links to uh, that story in the show notes for sure. Um, My story this week uh, comes from the Washington Post, uh, written by Michelle Borstein, Marissa uh, Iati, and Anis Shin. Uh, And it's titled, Top U.S. Catholic Church Official Resigns After Cell Phone Data Used to Track Him on Grindr and to Gay Bars. Uh, This is a fascinating story about... um, a publication, a journalist with uh, an organization called The Pillar, who was able to buy mobile app data from a data aggregator from a company who sells this sort of thing. Which they are allowed to do. Yeah, Nothing illegal about that. And then went through the process of de-anonymizing that data. And through that process basically outed a, a Catholic priest who had been using the hookup app Grinder, uh, and evidently, allegedly, this priest was also visiting gay bars. So I, as we go through this, I want to be really careful that we're not, uh, you know, kink-shaming or anything like that, uh, you know, for the priest himself. Right. The story is about an invasion of privacy. It's not right. about the priest himself. Right. Now, the yeah. priest has resigned uh, because, obviously, if these allegations are true, that runs afoul of uh, the, the, the 
commitments he's made as a priest and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So that is a part of the story, perhaps a, a bit salacious part of the story, I suppose. But um, what I'm really interested in here is the de-anonymization angle. You know, you and I have talked about, you know, if I have a set of anonymized data and I say, show me all the data points that – uh, sh- that are Ben's house, mm-hmm. and then also the ones that are where Ben works. Mm-hmm. Well, guess whose data I have? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? that's pretty easy investigative work. Yeah, right. you don't have to be a, a, a well trained detective to right. draw some connections. Just there. by correlating where someone like, where someone sleeps. So show me where this where this uh, device is pinging its cell phone tower. You know, in the middle of the night. So I know where that person sleeps. That's chances are that's their house, mm-hmm. and then where they go every day. Chances are that's their office. There is going to be a very small set of people who uh, align to both of those data points, and from there, Bob's your uncle, right? I mean, you have right. basically you're able to track someone's comings and goings pretty reliably, and that evidently is what this reporter did. Right. So the thing about de-anonymizing data is. In the vast majority of cases, nobody has enough of an incentive to really spend the time to to track somebody down. You kind of have to be motivated to do it. Mm-hmm. If you are motivated to do it, what this story indicates is that the data is out there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you have any sort of device, you are being tracked unless you turn off your location services. Right. Uh, and if somebody is willing enough and has, you know, the ability to devote their own resources, time and money to de-anonymizing that data, that's going to happen. And there's nothing that the legal system at this point can really do to stop it. There are no federal laws against uh, selling this anonymized data uh, mm-hmm. uh, or, or uh, banning anonymized data collection. And the state laws that exist aren't very robust, and they're generally geared towards specific scenarios like cyber stalking. Um, so they're not about things like this, which, you know, wouldn't actually implicate anybody in a crime. It's about personally embarrassing this priest and causing him to have to resign um, from his work. Uh, so I think the lesson here, unfortunately, is that Unless you really make an effort to keep your own movements uh, and your own activities anonymous, and it has to be a pretty robust effort, um, you are going to be subjected to the whims of the surveillance state, and there's very little that the legal system is going to do to protect you. Well, and and I mean that's the ball game, isn't it? I mean, how it seems to me like we're at a point now where if you want to participate in the world, if you want to have a mobile device. This is happening. If you're yeah. using any apps, um, and and it, again, you know, an app like Grinder, where you would think that um, anonymity is a would be a very important, a a key element that they would uh, that they would align themselves with. The fact that they are selling anonymized data to me is troubling. Um, but but again, they're I guess they're under the. Um, by saying it's anonymized, that that allows them to, uh, you know, say well, there's no problem here, right? Because right, and that's what to- Grinder said. Essentially, is um, the story itself is homophobic, right? Um, and they said, you know, the data described in it can't be publicly accessed. That's technically true, mm-hmm. um, but I think what this, the point this article makes, and the point we're trying to make, is that if somebody is determined enough, you can get answers from the anonymized data Mm -hmm. uh, about an individual person. Uh, That person can be tracked down. We don't know exactly how that happened uh, in the circumstances here, but it can happen and it will happen. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, it's just, uh, it's funny. At the end of this article, they mention uh, what we talked about in our previous story, uh, that, you know, Israeli military-grade spyware was leased to governments for tracking terrorists and criminals and human rights activists. Um, So, you know, I think you can fit this story into the broader theme of we're all being watched. Yeah. Not in a way, you know, to sound conspiratorial, but in a way, you know, that whether it's the private sector or the public sector, unless you are extremely careful uh, and extremely diligent about, you know, protecting your own anonymity and privacy— Information on you is going to be out there if you have a device. It's being collected. It is. You cannot stop it. Yeah, which is, you know, kind of chilling, especially for people uh, like the gentleman in this story who 
um, you know, wanted to obviously wanted to keep this uh, part of his life private right. and wasn't able to. Right. Um, and that's kind of a pitfall of the digital age. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also it uh, the fact that this journalist was able to do this and presumably not at great expense, you know, not at I don't I don't know the amount of effort that went into reporting this story, gathering this data, so on and so forth. But I guess where I'm going with this is I wonder, is this going to become standard operating procedure for everyone gathering information on a political rival? You know, where where were you uh, on the night of such and such, <laughs> Senator, right? Yeah. <laughs> if, it's, if it's easy to do or c- comparatively, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of money, time, or resources to do something like this. Is that the point where we get attention of policymakers? Right? Once their private affairs yes. have been uncovered? Yes. Possibly. I mean, maybe that's the way you get uh, a federal law passed. You know, it reminds me of the story back in the 80s when a Democratic senator who was running for president, Gary Hart, mm. there were rumors of extramarital affairs. Right. And he was like, follow me around. I got nothing to hide. <laughs> they did. And they followed him around. <laughs> Turns out he had stuff to hide. He had stuff to hide. <laughs> yeah. But at that point, you actually had to, like, put people on it. You right. Know? You actually right. had to tail him and follow right. him in a car and, and, you know, go to the house where he was having extramarital affairs. Yeah. Now we're realizing from this story and so many other stories, you know, it doesn't take that extensive of an investigation if you are, you know, motivated enough to do it to get private information on people. So, yeah, I mean, we really might start seeing more frequently in political advertising, you know, on the night of this disaster, such and such candidate had dinner at Applebee's. Clearly, he doesn't understand you right. know, the, the severity uh, of the event or, or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and you see, I mean, there's a case like this where this Monsignor's career is, is ruined, ruined uh, basically through guilt by association. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the tragic part of the story. Yeah. Um, there is a, a real human element to it. You know, I think the lesson for the rest of us is we have to be extremely diligent if, I mean, if this is something that you're interested in, some people just don't care about it, and mm-hmm. that's fine. But if you do care about the fact that you are being tracked, you cannot be passive about it. You really have to be active in in confronting uh, that information. Yeah. All right. Well, we will have a link to that in the show notes, of course. Um, if you have a question for us, we would love to hear from you. We have a call-in number. It's 410-618-3720. You can also write us at caveat at thecyberwire.com. And now another word from our sponsor, Privacy.com. We make transactions online every day in both our business and personal lives. How can you keep your critical personal and financial information safe and secure? With Privacy, generate virtual cards for each purchase you make online. With each card, you decide who can charge you, how much, and how often, and you can close cards anytime. For example, say you're signing up for a free trial to a subscription service. Instead of needing to remember to cancel the service once the trial period is over, simply close the card. Avoid any accidental overcharges without needing to jump through any customer service hoops or giving out your bank information. Sign up for free and get $5 towards any purchase online at privacy.com slash caveat. Ben, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Anup Ghosh. He is the CEO of Fidelis Cybersecurity. Uh, And our conversation centered on this notion of hacking back and whether or not that is a good idea in the private sector. Here's my conversation with Anup Ghosh. Hacking back has been something that has been discussed, um, actually a phenomenon that we've seen over the last two decades. Um, There have been some serious groups that have studied it as a matter of policy and feasibility. And, you know, at least in my two decades of being in security circles, I guess it's more than that now, every serious study I have seen has uh, concluded this is a, a bad idea, primarily because attribution of attacks is very hard. 
Also, oftentimes, uh, attackers use public infrastructure. Um, and so when you're hacking back, uh, you know, you're more likely hurting someone else other than whom you might intend. And, and finally, the consequences of escalation can go very badly uh, for victims. So, you know, from a uh, policy perspective, this is a bad idea. And I think uh, anyone who's who studied it has reached the same conclusions. Can we just get down to some of the real basics here? I mean, in general, what are folks talking about when they refer to hacking back? Well, I think what's really spurred the recent discussion is ransomware, right? Mm-hmm. And it is understandable when all of your uh, you know, personal files, uh, including photos, uh, might be encrypted and therefore lost. If your entire business has uh, uh, been essentially shut down because of a ransomware attack, you might, you certainly will feel very strong emotions about getting back at the perpetrators who have uh, really taken over your life. So I think Mm. it's a very emotional reaction, not to mention the fact that they're actually holding it ransom for money and sometimes a considerable amount of money. So it really is adding a lot of a lot of pain to this scenario. What are the comparisons to, you know, sort of real world uh, crimes? You know, if someone were to kidnap someone or someone were to you know, physically restrict access to a space or a business or something like that, you know, sure. there would be real world reactions there. Yeah, I, I, I think we do have real world analogies here that that hold up to some extent. So for example, you know, think about uh, someone breaking into your house, robbing you, and, um, and then later you actually find out, you know, or you think you find out who it is, right? Well, you might be tempted to uh, go and try and get back your, your stuff and maybe cause some pain on that person. We know, you know, first of all, this is illegal. Second, vigilantism uh, typically doesn't end well, right? And so, mm-hmm. you know, for these reasons, we do have law. We do have a justice system and law enforcement. And uh, the same holds true in the cyber domain. Uh, we, we might think we know who, who got at us, but chances are uh, we really don't. And anything we uh, attempt to do against the adversary outside of our own networks can end badly, just like it might in the real world. Yeah, it strikes me, too, that you know, even though we have um, robust laws for defending your homestead, for example, you know, your, the castle doctrine, um, you're, still, you're not allowed to, to have booby traps all around your property. You know, that, that sort of thing isn't allowed. Well, you know, I, I, I think you bring up a really interesting point, which is you are allowed to defend your property, right? In many states, uh, what does it stand my ground uh, kind mm-hmm. of laws, the castle doctrine, as you mentioned. And, and that's, uh, that actually does uh, create a guide, uh, I think, in the security profession that you are allowed to defend your network, right? And if you do encounter an adversary on your network, you are allowed to engage and counter that adversary. And, and actually, that's, that's a discussion we should be having, in my mind, is not the hack back. It's the detect, respond, counter your adversary on your network. And, and you are allowed to do that by, by law. So, and, and there are different levels of uh, detection and response you can take, you know, active defense is something that is getting more fluency now in security circles um, as, as, a, as a philosophy, as a doctrine, if you will. What about the, the folks who are frustrated that, for example, the, they say the federal government isn't doing enough to defend us against these, these ransomware operators, for example, they're coming from foreign countries where they're, they're not being pursued by the government and law enforcement in their own countries, 
Um, and they say, you know, if, if this, again, if, if, a, if a foreign army came to the U.S. and shut down my business, there'd be a strong reaction from U.S. law enforcement and our military. We're not seeing that happen in the cyber domain. And so people are frustrated at that. Yeah, and the frustration is understandable, uh, especially mm-hmm. if it's you, right, who, who ends up being the victim, Right. Uh, yeah. and, and, the, and, and so, yeah, I, I think it is important that we speak up, we hold our representatives uh, accountable for uh, deterrence and, and action. And uh, the truth is, uh, the U.S. government uh, does have a lot of power to you know, either strike back or cause uncomfortable pain to uh, sponsors of these attacks. The challenge, however, is it's probably not going to be on a timeline that you know satisfies our uh, immediate need for uh, justice, if you will, right? Mm-hmm. And the the government uh, can leverage a lot more authorities than private individuals or, or companies can, and in ways that perhaps we wouldn't even think about. So, for example, and this isn't. Uh, theoretical, uh, we've seen this happen time and again. Economic trade, of course, is one uh, means of uh, us holding people accountable. You know, sanctions not only against countries but also individuals can create a lot of pain uh, for actors. And the, and these are sort of on the diplomatic side, uh, the law enforcement side. We've seen a lot of takedowns of uh, infrastructure right, uh, botnet infrastructure, but also takedowns of individuals. The use of sealed indictments has, has been a powerful weapon in being able to round up perpetrators that have, you know, crossed outside the boundaries of their protection, right? And, and so this has turned out to be fairly effective, and the U.S. government has far better attribution capabilities through its intelligence agencies than any individual or private company can. So uh, we've seen it happen before um, in the Obama administration, uh, you know, even at, at the most senior levels when President Obama met with China's premier. We saw a dramatic action on that front. Uh, we've seen named indictments of Chinese PLA. So there are measures that can be taken that are far broader than what individuals or companies can take in the U.S., and we just need to make sure that our government is focused on that. Do you suppose there there might be a communications gap here? Because as you know, as you and I have been talking about, I think there is that powerful emotional component, and I think sometimes people feel as though they're not being heard. That um, you know they're not seeing a direct and immediate response, and and perhaps if there was a way for uh, law enforcement to say, look, we hear you, we see what's going on, um, you know, we're we're working on it, um, and. Uh, trust us, you know, that things are being done, even though they might not seem, uh, you know, uh, evident or immediate. Yeah. And I, I don't think you'll really, uh, be able to build that trust until we see better results. Um, so for example, hmm. an individual's business or machine being held ransom is not going to get the attention of the FBI. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a critical infrastructure that, uh, like Colonial Pipeline, that ends up causing gas lines uh, throughout the East Coast in, in the summer, that's going to cause a lot of pain for politicians, uh, for the president in particular, right? It, you know, it's one of those weird things that people watch, which is how much do I pay for gas, right? Right. And, you know, I, it was interesting During that same week, the White House had released its executive order, which was more, I I think, esoteric, you know, and and people in security circles and and certainly federal security circles paid attention to that while the rest of the nation did not. That same week is when the Colonial Pipeline ransomware uh, made news. And that my reaction was, this is more likely to get action than the executive order just because of uh, the price of gas going up and people staying in gas lines it actually creates real political pain for the president. Hmm. And, and we have seen some stronger words come out recently from the Biden administration that it will hold Russia accountable. 
And I think that is the right strategy going forward, which is, look, foreign governments that are harboring criminals can only say, uh, you know, for so long, we're not responsible because perhaps they're, uh, you know, they're implying these are private individuals or, or contractors. But the reality is oftentimes they are intelligence agencies. And even when they are private individuals, they're operating uh, under the sanctuary set up by these foreign regimes. And that part has to end. You know, that cannot be tolerated. And we have to make that clear. And, and more to the point, we need to establish norms and uh, red lines, right? And, and that, I don't think that's been that effective, right? So what is acceptable hacking, if you will? I put that in quotes, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And what is unacceptable that should you cross this line, uh, there will be reaction and the reaction will cause pain. And we have, you know, a series of escalation capabilities uh, that will seriously hurt you, right? And, and that doctrine, if you will, has not been made real clear. And therefore, um, you know, actors, foreign governments are, feel free to continue to allow the activity to happen. Yeah, it's, it seems to me like, you know, you think about a, a demonstration of capabilities, you know, but then you, but then you have the danger of escalation, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I do think that Russia, China, other foreign governments have an understanding of the U.S.'s capability in mm. this area. And, and it's, it's number one, bar none, right? Are we willing to demonstrate that capability, to do a demonstration in order to flex. Reality is we're not because doing so would burn our methods, right? And then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to use them at a future time. Mm-hmm. But what is powerful, I believe, is uh, some of the law enforcement actions, right? That, that can actually, if you can get to the right folks using both uh, sort of traditional criminal investigations, which turn out to be very powerful in this fight, as well as uh, cyber uh, forensics and cooperation with uh, private companies, particularly ones that control infrastructure. You know, that sort of private-public cooperation is a linchpin to being able to identify who are the perpetrators behind and that it is up to the U.S. government to take action um, and we have seen this before, right? And and it, it needs to be organized and it needs to be uh, made clear when you take certain actions, there will be certain reactions that are far more uncomfortable. You know, people use the word proportionate, uh, but it has to be a little bit disproportionate, to be honest, to, to get mm. to have that deterrent effect. Ben, what do you think? It's really interesting to talk about the analogs in the non-digital world. Mm. Because I think oftentimes the reaction is, all right, well, if somebody, you know, attacks me, I'm going to defend myself. That's not really what the analog is. Hacking back is not simply defending yourself. Mm -hmm. As uh, the interviewee said, it's not a simple castle doctrine thing where, like, you come into my network— I will destroy you. Right. It's, instead, it's <laughs> you come into my house. I'm going to go to your go house to your and burn house. It down. And, exactly. Uh, <laughs> right, in case right. you haven't heard, that's illegal uh, vigilanteism. Right. Yeah, um, and that's yeah. why hacking back is a bad idea, <laughs> um, which seemed to be uh, the general theme of the interview and and my perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I do have a follow up conversation with him uh, that's going to air over on the CyberWire where we talk about. This notion of active defense within your network, sort of sort of a middle ground. So if it's a topic you're interested in, uh, that'll be running, uh, I think, in the next week or so over on the CyberWire. Do a, do a search for uh, a NUP or uh, Fidelis Cybersecurity and you'll find it. It's a, sort of an interesting part two to this conversation. And, of course, we want to thank him for joining us. And we want to thank our sponsors, Privacy.com. Head to privacy.com slash caveat and sign up for an account. New customers will automatically get $5 to spend on your first purchase. Go to privacy.com slash caveat and sign up now.
That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. <laughs>